And um, I want to um, first thank our um, guest, Dr. Doré, for being here and joining us and for his interest in um, the position of chancellor of our district. And I also want to again thank folks here dur who during a very busy week have come to spend some time on what is a very, very important process, I think, of um, consultation, of, of thinking about a candidate, and then giving <coughs> feedback to the board. So I'll say uh, a little bit um, about that now, and then we'll hear from Dr. Dorey, get a chance to get to know him better. Um, so, we're going to have about um, one hour for the forum, and about 25 minutes of that will be for general questions, and I'll read those. I think they're questions that we would all want to make sure we, we heard some response to. Um, and then we'll have 25 or 30 minutes for your questions. The board is very, very interested in having our feedback um, I would take that quite seriously. As I think you know, there are some hard copy forms that are available and can be collected right here. And we also have the forms available online at the district website. And Carity tells me that we'll also be, she's reminding me that we'll also be sending those out to everyone. So if you feel more comfortable doing it online, um, if you can get it in today, that would be <coughs> fantastic. Um, but maybe by tomorrow noon would be would be good and um, I assure you you know they will they will be read um so without further ado um once again I want to um, offer a very warm Chabot welcome to Dr. Dore and um hear your opening statement and then we'll go into the questions Can, do I need that little <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Sperling. Can I just get a sense of, uh, do we have students in the group? We've got some students, a faculty. We got, oh, we've got some faculty, staff, and administrators, and, and we have community members here? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, first, I, I do want to uh, thank you for taking the time to come to this forum. I know this is a very busy time of year, and also let you know that it, it really is a, a great honor to be considered for this position. So I'd like to tell you uh, just a little bit about my background, a little bit about my personal background and before I go into a little bit my career, uh, because I think that's a little relevant as to, as to who I am. So I was born in Pennsylvania uh, from a large family, and neither of my parents went to college, so I am a first-generation college student. Um, and uh, my youngest sister was born with uh, developmental disabilities and cerebral palsy. And when she was, you know, not, not long after, when she was about six months or so, uh, doctors really told my parents that she probably never would walk, she probably never would talk, and she wouldn't really function. And my parents did not accept that assessment, and my sister did learn how to walk, and she did learn how to talk, and she learned how to ride a bike, and she learned how to swim, and so forth. But growing up with a disabled sister, I think really helped to shape who I w became as an adult and, and really two, 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 I think, powerful things that, that, that really came to me from growing up with Joni. Uh, one was that I, I saw throughout her life how she did not have access uh, and she was excluded from a lot of, 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 of both institutionally and then even from a social uh, perspective. And I remember my parents uh, used to tell us that if Joni was not welcome, uh, then we were not welcome and we would not be part of that or we would fight to make sure that she was welcome. So as a result of that, I think open access uh, has, has always been a real passion of mine. And then the other, I think, that, that I really learned from her is that she was also excluded a lot. And so I think creating inclusive communities, I think, really uh, is something that, that became important to me. So after I graduated from college, um, because my life was really transformed by education, I uh, wanted to be a teacher. And so I actually became a high school teacher and did that for a couple of years. 
and I'll share one experience. Uh, when I was a teacher, I uh, took my students, this was in Oil City, Pennsylvania, my second year of, of teaching. Uh, I took my students down to spend the day. We were, we were studying learning theory, so, so I uh, made arrangements. We spent the day on the set of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which is actually filmed in, uh, it, was, it was filmed back then in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, so we spent the whole day on the set, and Fred Rogers actually spent an entire hour with my class, and then he spent some time with me. And I, I asked him from, for some advice uh, on how to be a good teacher. And I'll never forget what he told me, and I think it really has, has shaped my career as a, as a faculty member. He said, remember that love really is the, the, the center of all learning. And so I think as a teacher, I really tried to uh, create environments that, um, that really welcome students. So uh, I also taught at the university level, but, but I really found my passion uh, when I came to California, I was doing some graduate work, and uh, I really decided that I wanted to be a community college instructor. And so I, I got a position, a uh, full-time uh, position at San Francisco City College, where I taught uh, for 15 years as a tenured faculty member, and had the opportunity to teach a wide range of courses. I taught everything from credit to non-credit courses. I, I taught everything from uh, basic skills courses all the way up to honors courses. Uh, and, and in, in various formats. Also had the opportunity to participate in shared governance. Uh, I was elected uh, to the um, Executive Council of the Academic Senate where I served. I also served as chair of shared governance committees. And then also was elected as the chair of the business department in San Francisco, um, which is one of the largest departments. Did that for six years and then became uh, dean of the School of Business in the downtown campus uh, in San Francisco. Uh, and from there I went to uh, Maricopa Community Colleges where I was Dean of Career and Technical Education. And then from there I went to Pima Community College which is uh, wh where I am now. My current position, I am the president of three comprehensive campuses. Uh, the downtown campus, the, the northwest campus, and the community campus. Uh, and I also oversee uh, three adult basic education learning centers as part of that role and an aviation technology center. Additionally, I serve as Vice Chancellor of Workforce and Economic Development for the district, and my role in, in, in that position is really to ensure uh, alignment across Pima County and through the entire state uh, for workforce alignment and for transfer alignment uh, of all of our programs and to build partnerships with, with uh, business and industry, K-12, and so forth. So that's a little bit about kind of a, a rundown of my career. And then in terms of, um, of leadership, um, as a president now, um, I feel that my primary role and the most important role is to really be the champion of open access uh, for Pima Community College, uh, of equity for Pima Community College, and then of student success. Additionally, my role is to ensure that our resources are aligned to those three priorities of the institution. Uh, and then finally, I think one of the most important roles is to build a culture of trust uh, in the organization. And in terms of trust, my approach to building trust, um, I think number one, um, I strive to be authentic. And what that means is that uh, I'm sincere. I, I align my inner passion with who I am publicly. Uh, try to, and I'm very honest uh, in, in my approach to leadership. Secondly, um, I uh, have a priority both for myself and for my team to have a very high uh, degree of competency and make sure that, that we're good at what we do because uh, if, if you're good at what you do, people have uh, more of a likelihood to trust you. And then finally, I think empathy is probably one of the most important components to my leadership style in terms of really being genuinely interested in uh, the perspective of others and to respect that perspective and to honor that perspective um, in, in my own leadership. So that's a little bit about my background and I'm ready for your questions. <coughs> Okay, so our first general question is, would you please share with us why you think you should be the next chancellor of Chabot Las Positas Community College District? Okay. Um, well, first I, I want to tell you 
uh, I'll, I'll focus uh, about Chabot specifically, and I've certainly researched the district, but uh, first of all, I'm, I'm very interested in this position because I'm very interested in this institution because I think this college really um, has embraced many of the things that I am deeply passionate about. So, so number one, I think that I would bring a tremendous amount of energy and passion to the position. Um, you know, Chabot, uh, in my years in, in San Francisco, uh, Chabot has really been a leader, I think, in, in, around equity issues. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, of, which, which you're well aware, that the Puente program was founded here at Chabot, and that's really been a national, I think, standard for, uh, for a lot of other programs around ethnicity in terms of inclusion. So I think this institution has, has really set a very, uh, a very high mark for equity, and I think it's an equity-minded institution. So, so that's what's really draws me to, to Chabot. Um, and then in terms of what I could bring, again, I think I bring uh, a progressively, um, you know, uh, approach in terms of having served in many different roles. I think I have an understanding of urban education, having served in San Francisco, um, have a, an experience uh, really of working in very diverse institutions and very successful in those institutions. And then in my current position, uh, I have really had to learn how to juggle the responsibilities of multiple campuses and multiple sites and multiple roles and responsibilities, which would be similar to this type of position. Thank you. Would you please give us one specific example of how your management style has helped to move an initiative forward? So we have, we have a lot of initiatives that we're moving forward at, at Pima. Um, Guided Pathways would be uh, one. Uh, and I think my style, again, is to, is to make sure that we are uh, including people in the decision-making process as we move things forward. Uh, I think another unique ability, I don't know if it's unique, but it's, it's, it's distinctive to, to my style, and that is, is that um, I, I really value uh, multiple perspectives, and, um, and I, don't, um, I don't take critical feedback personally. Right. I actually um, want to be informed when, when how we're, we're moving initiatives forward, so I really want to involve a lot of people. And again, I'll give the example of, of Guided Pathways. The implementation of Guided Pathways is so complex. It's obvious, of course, faculty need to be involved, but there's so many uh, individuals and constituencies that need to be involved. Students, obviously, need to be involved in how we're designing those pathways. Uh, IT needs to be involved because uh, technology becomes such an important component. Scheduling. So, so the implementation of um, something like guided pathways, one could assume that, oh, it really impacts only these constituencies, but it really impacts practically everyone in the institution to do this successfully. Uh, advising is absolutely critical. So, so I think, you know, my approach is to make sure that, that all voices are heard uh, so that we can do things right the first time. But also, I think my style is, is that I don't get wedded to a position. So if we're moving along and we've made some mistakes, let's, let's own those mistakes and let's, let's go back and try to fix things and, and not be wedded to moving forward no matter what. So I think this next question is um, my favorite. Well, no, it's the last one. This is, this is, Please describe your financial management experience. Okay. So I, I actually come out of uh, my discipline is, uh, is business. So I taught business for my career. I taught uh, before I entered the community college. I, I taught in the MBA program at St. Joseph's University. So I come out of a, um, a strong financial background. Uh, and then um, I really started working in, in budgeting you know, when, when I became a department chair uh, in San Francisco where I was responsible for a very large department in San Francisco. The business department uh, had 28 uh, labs. 
uh, that I was responsible for, and we had to make sure that those labs were upgraded and so forth. Uh, and so I was in charge of, 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 of a department budget, and then when I became dean, I was in charge of, um, of the, the campus budget at the downtown campus and then the School of Business budget. Uh, additionally, I've overseen a number of grants. Uh, when I was in the Maricopa Community College District, I was the lead, administrative lead, on a successful award of a TACT grant uh, that was awarded to Mesa Community College. And then uh, I oversee a number of grants at Pima. Uh, all of our campuses have upward bound grants. Uh, and uh, we also uh, have just received a Title III grant at our downtown campus. I've, I've worked with Title V grants as well and, and the management of that. Uh, and then I'm responsible for uh, my component of the budget of the district. Our, our district has a general fund budget of uh, a, a, a approximately $200 million per year. And we have actually had significant state uh, cuts, in fact, Pima and Maricopa have, have actually been completely zeroed out by the state of Arizona. So uh, I've, I've had to implement uh, $5 million cuts per year over the last three years. Um, I, I should say collectively, and, and I've had a component of that. Uh, and so I have, have a, uh, a, I think, extensive background in budgeting, and particularly in building a budget that really is built um, transparently and with involvement of all the units. So our budgeting process really begins with the, at the unit level with program reviews and, 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 and on up. Um, and then again, I see my role as to make sure that our final budget really is aligned with the mission of the institution. Okay, this, this really is my favorite of these questions. Um, <clears throat> although I didn't write the questions, but I like this one. Tell us about a time you failed and how you rebounded. I, I, I failed a lot. <laughs> so uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll use the example that I gave um, at, at Las Positas. Um, and that is, we were doing a reorganization of the district uh, early on in my tenure there. And um, after uh, uh, some input, um, folks wanted more synergy between student affairs and instruction. And we were trying to really think of some innovative ways to, to create that synergy and, and working more collaboratively together. Uh, and so uh, a number of folks kind of proposed this and, 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 and we, we said, let's go ahead and move forward on that. And that was to have um, some deans at our smaller campuses who were these sort of like hybrid deans. So they had a student affairs role and then they had an instructional role as well. So we implemented that. And after assessing it, both from a student perspective, from a faculty staff perspective and so forth, uh, we concluded that it really wasn't effective. It didn't work. So uh, we actually went back and um, kind of restructured again to, 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 to align it. Um, but one of the things in terms of failure and my approach to failure is, you know, most of the the most significant things that I've learned um, have been when I failed. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm not really afraid of failure in the institution as long as we are you know, making uh, you know, calculated, uh, innovative uh, risks, um, then, then I really I support that. And I, and I want to make sure that an environment is, is safe for people to go ahead and be innovative. Now we have an opportunity to ask our questions. Okay. Yes, um, we're a community. And so I'd like to invite folks who have questions to come up to this side of our venue and to speak into the microphone. I want to remind you we have about 30 seconds to ask each question. Uh, it turns out you can say quite a lot in 30 seconds. Um, because we want to make sure that everyone who wants to ask a question has a turn to ask a question. Um, I will sort of gently tap people on the shoulder who, just to remind them of timing if, if we go over. But in any case, we also want to give Dr. Doré you know, 
as much time as possible to answer. So um, with that said, our Student Senate President. Hi, my name is Lorenzo. Hi, Lorenzo. I'm a student senator. I happen to be the president for the Student Senate. Uh, my question is, uh, you mentioned you know, honoring uh, all perspectives. How do you, in a chancellor position, intend on honoring um, perspectives, uh, especially of those who are not as plugged in as, say, student senators, uh, particularly in the case of students? How do you honor those perspectives, creating or facilitating or supporting, perhaps, in your position, a culture which is inclusive, particularly to those who are not as plugged into resources that are available? And I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. Can everybody hear me? I don't know if I, that microphone's loud enough. So, and, and I think that is one of the, the challenges that I think all colleges face, is right, how to get as many students involved and get their input as possible. Uh, and I have always worked very closely with the student government. When I was dean, uh, when I became dean at downtown campus in San Francisco, each of our campuses have their own student government. So I actually met with that student government, um, the, the leaders uh, every week when I was there. And I, I, I work very closely with students now. But, but I think that the real question is then, how do you get to all of those students? So I, uh, again, I'll go back to San Francisco. Um, I initiated town hall meetings early on as soon as I became dean. And I found those very well attended. And one of the ways that I really helped to get students involved is from the faculty, because the faculty are able to get a lot of students, maybe students that are not necessarily engaged in clubs and engaged at that level, they can get them to some of these events. So I worked very closely with faculty. I think that's, that's one way. Uh, we do a lot of surveys that send out to students, but I also understand that you know students get so many surveys, a lot of times they don't want to fill those out. But, but I think that's another way is to make sure that we're hearing that voice um, of, 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 of students. Um, we participate at Pima in, in uh, what's called the Voluntary Framework of Accountability, and part of that um, really requires that we send out uh, a number of student satisfaction surveys and so forth. The other thing is, I think if we, you know, I've tried to really embrace, support, and celebrate a lot of our various, uh, you know, cultural events, and I think that draws students in as well. So, you know, that's very important, and I know that's very important here to have a number of cultural events. So, you know, Latin Latinx Heritage Month and, and African American Heritage Month, I think we can bring a lot of students in there, and I personally like to participate in, in a lot of those. Um, I. My approach, if I was the chancellor here, um, is really to, to be very present and to be on campus. You know, I, I've never been at a district office, so I'm not used to, to, to what that means because I've always spent all my time on a campus, and that's really my preference. And so um, I, I, I would not see myself as much uh, sitting in a district office as more really being out in the community, out with business and industry, and of course out with students. Okay. Hi, uh, my Hello. name is um, Yvonne Wu Craig, and I am the Executive Director of Institutional Advancement here at Chabot College. I oversee um, the foundation and um, our grants department as well. Um, and uh, through uh, the history of how our um, district has developed um, with the various different campuses, um, we have three foundations, two at each. Uh, one at each college and then a district foundation as well. And so in your role as chancellor being at the district, what do you see as your role in, um, uh, well, what do you see as the role of the district foundation in relation to the college foundations and, um, um, and then your experience, just, uh, just you know, touch upon um, some of your fundraising experience as well. Great. Um. Thank you. I got that same question at Las Positas as well. So I'll give some of the same answers. Um, well, first I'll talk about the, 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 the grants and, and contracts. Uh, you know, I think that at Pima we've been very successful in, in grant development and then contract development. We have a very large um, 
uh, contract education. Uh, and I'll give some examples of just recent awards that we, we have received. Um, we just were, were notified, um, this is actually a continuation. Uh, we uh, were awarded a five-year grant uh, for the, from the U.S. Air Force. So we do all of the paramedic training for the entire U.S. Air Force at Pima Community College. What happens is, is the students come to um, Davis Mothan Air Force Base and they live there, they get assigned there and then they come over to Pima. And what we had to do is we had to do, we had to work very closely with faculty because we had to accelerate that program. Took that program down to four months and anybody that knows paramedic, it's really hard to get a program down to four months. But we're very proud of that and proud of the students to go through that because they have a 99% pass rate on the national licensing exam. So, so what, what, I, what I would say is, is that um, uh, I've really been a big advocate of, of generating revenue through contracts. Um, we also I'll give another example. Uh, um, Caterpillar Surface Mining Division um, uh, was considering locating to Tucson, Arizona. And Pima Community College, we were at the table with the site selectors to help really court them to come to Tucson. They did choose to come to Tucson, Arizona, which meant that they relocated 600 very high paying engineering positions to Tucson. And as a result of our relationship with them, we've entered into a, a contract with them um, in fact, earlier this fall, Governor Doug Ducey came to our campus at the downtown campus to celebrate and to announce that partnership. Essentially what we're doing is we're providing um, welding and machine tool uh, courses to their engineers so their engineers can better understand what the technicians. In terms of uh, foundation, uh, we're work I'm working very closely with our foundation now, and ours is, our, our, our fundraising efforts are really around our centers of excellence. And I, I think that, you know, we have, we have um, six comprehensive campuses in our district, and uh, so what we're looking at is how to, to brand each of those campuses for their own unique um, approach to uh, potential donors and so forth. Uh, but we're doing that strategically as a district. And so, you know, my approach in terms of the foundation at Las Positas, the uh, foundation at Chabot, and then the district is that, f first of all, that, that we're working together and that we're really strategically looking at the whole region and how we can best position each of the foundations uh, really to, um, if you will, court and build those relationships based upon, I think, the distinctive branding of each of the colleges and then how we could really draw donors based upon that. So it's a little bit about my approach. Um, because, you know, I, and I'll give an example. You know, we were meeting with the foundation and the foundation was very clear with us, you know, in terms of your centers of excellence, we're interested in, 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 in manufacturing, so we're interested in applied technology, which meant, okay, that's going to be for the downtown campus. Um, so, so that's really my approach. And, and as the chancellor, uh, my role is to really build uh, those relationships and to help the colleges with those relationships from a regional perspective. Good afternoon, Dr. Gray. My name is Greg Reese, and I'm a senior member of the Chabot College uh, Classified staff. And my question to you is based around your comment that you want to empower, empower your staff and your administration to do what they do. When, before you empower these people, are you going to, and what steps are you going to uh, ensure are taken to make sure that our, in particular, our administrative staff are of the highest caliber and not only professional conduct but and, and uh, resume, but an ethical and uh, moral and professional conduct and behavior during the course of their duties. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, I'll talk a little bit about um, my experience at Pima in that you know we have um, expectations for all leaders at at Pima Community College and, and that's published and that's out there for everyone in which we include a lot of the elements that you're talking about in, ter in terms of ethical um, behavior and so forth. But I think uh, 
the, 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 the way to address that from the existing staff, because I mean, when you're onboarding, obviously you're looking for all that as part of the hiring process, right? Um, I think you, you hire for competency, um, but, but you know, when, when we're, we're hiring now, um, the, the, the committees, you know, they can assess, for example, for faculty, they, they can assess the competency a lot better than I do because you know the credentials and so forth of your dis discipline and so forth. So I'm really looking more for that kind of fit um, for, for those, th those um, some of those broader skills and so forth as well. The ability to work with our students, to, the ability to work with a diverse staff. Um, but, but again, coming back to the existing staff, I think that's where professional development comes into play. And so that, uh, you know, all of our managers and leaders and department heads, um, they go through a, a lot, which I'm sure you do here as well. But we're very intentional about what that professional uh, d development is. So um, we did, we rolled out a, 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 a training called Pathways to Civility. Right, which is really about engaging people in, in a in a kind and civil way, and to maintain professionalism. Um, we also um, had all of our administrators go through um, what we what we called pathways out of poverty, but it really is for them to have a better understanding of the experience, particularly of our students, um, and 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 that's really for everyone that people understand that something as simple as a bus being late uh, can destroy a day for one of our students. And so, you know, how can we really be a little more um, understanding of the experience of our students and, and some of the poverty issues that they are going through? So I think uh, onboarding would be I think the most important. So you're looking for a certain, uh, you know, person when you are hiring them, and then training and professional development um, for the existing organ uh, employees. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Bruce Griffin. I'm the Chief Technology Officer. And Peter Drucker once said that culture trumps strategy. Can you talk a little bit about the culture you want to instill within the district? Yes, I'm, I'm quite familiar with, with, that, with that line. Um, and, and, and I would not be so presumptuous to say that, that I'm going to be able to come in here and change the culture, right? Uh, but, but what I can do in terms of, of culture and my approach is I think um, setting a tone does start at, at very often at the top of the organization and people look to see what are the values of your chancellor what are the values of the person that is that is leading the organization and um, I said this when I came to Pima and I've said this when I when I come to most places um, don't 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 trust me yet right um, watch me see how I behave uh, see see how I how I lead and then hopefully I will earn your trust. And so, you know, for me, um, I think that the most important component to good uh, organizational culture is to create a culture where people feel safe, right? Not necessarily f safe not to do their job, but that they feel safe to speak up, they feel safe to grow, they feel safe to um, to really question and to take some chances. And so that, that's sort of, I think, the approach that, that I would have. Uh, and then setting the, the clear expectations for me start with my team, my immediate team. And so, you know, all of the members of my team know now on my cabinet know that the student voice is supreme, right? So I want to hear uh, when everybody's talking, when we're, 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 we're in cabinet meetings, we're talking, I want to hear how you have reflected on how this is going to make the student experience better. And if you're not, if you're not thinking that through, then you really haven't done a very good job. And so, again, for me, it's, it's for me to set that with my team, and then, and then my team knows what their expectations are. Um, I expect my team to be professional at all times. And, and uh, I know for some people it's, 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 it's a little harder than others, but uh, if you're attacked and you're attacked unjustly, um, 
That's part of life, right? And that's part of leadership. And so, you know, sit and listen to people and remember that you're in a position of authority. And so um, you need to be very careful about um, making sure that you are continually allowing people to speak up and, and to voice their perspective. Hi there. Hello. Thank you for being here today at Chabot College. My name is Laura Lacon, and I have two questions for you that are not related. Okay? Yes. So I am the Vice President of the Faculty Senate, and as you may know, the Academic Senate uh, cast a vote of no confidence towards the Chancellor last year. So I'm wondering if you are aware of the concerns expressed in that document and how does your leadership style may address the issues raised. And, and, and can I follow up with a question for you? Because <laughs> I, I am aware. Okay. Uh, but if you can, for me, encapsulate maybe in a few sentences what you believe was the primary reason for that no confidence vote. Because I, I, I knew there, was, there were a number of <coughs> issues, but it, in terms of, of, of leadership style, it's all in the document. So first, I want to know if you read it, okay? But um, if I have to say, I think that there were a lot of issues that were coming and they were rolling, okay? They were definitely growing. I think that when um, things got a little bit different, more difficult, were um, issues around declaring Chaboy Sanctuary Campus. So that there were, you know, a lot right, more no, things I, going I, on there. I, I, I remember there were quite a few things in there. Um, so that's a great question in terms of, so are you asking how would I prevent a no confidence vote? Um, uh, <laughs> I, think, I, I think that, um, I think what's important is that, um, that the dialogue stay open and that I as your leader, if I was selected for this position, I'm, I'm really listening to the voice of the college community, right? Not, not simply listening to the loudest voice in the college community, but listening to the entire voice of the, of the college community and, um, and, and being informed by that voice uh, uh, along the way and to making decisions. Uh, I believe that the best way to make decisions is if you can come to consensus and if you can hear folks out uh, and, 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 and then sometimes th there needs to be compromise as well. So I don't know if, if I've answered your question or not. Let's say you did. Let's say you did. But this is my second question, okay? So, I would like to know where you get your information from, okay, in a variety of issues, and specifically, I want to know what articles or journals do you read, what podcasts do you listen to, what programs do you watch to inform yourself about issues related to the intersectionality within diverse groups, and how this information has shaped your practice in higher education. Wonderful. So. I, I do have a little blog, which you could probably go on and see so, some of the some of the, um, the the work that I've been involved in around really understanding, particularly culturally cultural competency. Um, and I'll, I'll 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 tell you how I'm informed. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll back up and give a, a little bit of history. So when I came to uh, as president of the downtown campus, uh, a group of faculty um, came to see me. Um, Really, to, to they felt that this was uh, one of the first times that, that they that they would be heard and so forth. And so um, I, I, I listened. I met with them, and uh, as a result of that, we um, established uh, the first summit on uh, ethnic, gender, and transborder studies at Pima Community College. That was at the downtown campus. Uh, in which we brought together um, scholars around uh, a, a number of cultural issues. Um, and we've, we've repeated that every year. Some good things have come out of that. You know, one of the things is, is that Pima did not have a, uh, a, an ethnic, gender, and transborder studies department. And as a result of that summit, we actually established an academic department. And then uh, we also uh, 
that department sponsors a number of, of lectures where we bring scholars um, every year. Uh, this year we were celebrating uh, the 50th anniversary of Pima Community College and the 50th anniversary of uh, Mexican American Studies at Pima Community College. So, so we, we brought a number of scholars around Mexican American Studies uh, in as well. Uh, much of my work at Pima has been around uh, really trying to understand better Native American populations and to understand uh, the experience of, uh, of Mexican American uh, uh, populations as well. Um, when I was in San Francisco, we had a very high Asian population, and so uh, I really learned a, lo a lot as well about, about um, various cultures. I myself, I come out of a, an LGBTQ background, and so um, I, I think that um, for me, I think that I am committed to uh, dialoguing with various groups that are different so that I really can understand uh, the perspective and experience of, 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 of everyone that we're serving uh, at the college. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you uh or your thoughts around technology, both in the classroom and administratively? Technology in the classroom? <laughs> as well as administratively. As well as administratively. Um, I think technology is probably uh, you know, more important in uh, higher education today probably than it's ever been because it's really transforming our, our, our service and delivery um, to students. And so uh, first, I'll talk about the, the organization as a whole. Um, you know, we're implementing a lot of uh, tech, technology uh, software packages really to make delivery, particularly, let's say, around, around guided pathways. So, you know, one would be um, we, we're implementing now um, uh, Ad Astra, which is a, a scheduling software that has a predictive analytics as part of that so that we're really trying to build a schedule that can serve students in the pathway and then we can build that schedule more efficiently. So I think, I think technology is crucial to scheduling. I think around uh, student affairs, um, I think that um, uh, we're using a software, uh, we call it Pima Connect, but it's actually um, Starfish. And um, uh, that really allows us to you know, track students much better and then interact with students in a, in a much more proactive way. And then an entire team, not just faculty and advisors, but, you know, uh, veterans services, um, accessibility and disabled resources and so forth. Um, trying to think. Then what we're, we're building right now, uh, a, a business intelligence system, again, to do those kind of predictive things with data so that all of the faculty and staff um, can actually now go in and access a dashboard, but then they can actually disaggregate the data very specifically for, for, for their population that they really want to look at in terms of student outcomes and so forth. And then in the classroom, I think, you know, we are now planning uh, a new center for applied technology and uh, IT is, is, is at they were at the programmatic stage, they'll be at the pre-design stage, because so much of, particularly in applied technology now, you know, you're, you're going to have all the students that, that are really working with, uh, you know, mobile devices, and so how those can really effectively interact in an automotive technology uh, facility and so forth. So I think that um, technology is absolutely crucial. Uh, number one, our students are doing most of their activities today on mobile devices, and so, uh, you know, we've also created a number of platforms so that students can really, um, you know, go in and, 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 and they can uh, apply to the college and so forth all on their mobile device. I want to just, as the timekeeper, remind folks we have about five more minutes for questions. Good evening. My name is David Betts. I'm from Human Resources and serve as Director of Employee and Labor Relations. Uh, my question is really about uh, balance. So as a chancellor, you're pulled in different <coughs> directions. You have your direct reports, which are going to be your vice chancellors and college presidents. Um, you want to interact with students. Um, there's also community and fundraising. 
um, a, a need to be seen around the district as well as in the district office, um, also family as well. How do you work to balance all of that so that you're meeting all of those obligations and not putting too much in any one place or, or not doing enough in any one place? Great question. Um, and I think I'm 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 in my my current role is 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 somewhat similar in that uh, you know, when I first came to Pima, I was president of one campus, and and then we've done a number of, of reorganizations. So, so now I have three campuses and and, and a number of learning centers. Uh, and that, that was a different type of leadership style because uh, that, that first year I was able actually to meet with each of the full-time faculty at the Northwest Campus one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And, and so I could really get to know people. And in my current role, that's really not possible. So uh, I do understand that, that, you, 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 that, that one needs to be much more um, public and strategic about how you're interfacing with the community and so forth. Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to do now is to make sure that when I am physically on a campus that I can uh, have exposure to as many folks as possible and to do that in a more strategic manner so that you're not just showing up but you're showing up at a time and a place where you know you're going to be uh, interacting and hearing from a number of people. But I think it's important that the, the chancellor still take time to really uh, do a deeper dive into, into some elements of the district. Uh, and, and, and I'll give an example. Um, you know, again, when I came to Pima, uh, I had never really uh, been over uh, a science lab before and so um, it was important for me to, to, to do a deeper dive and, and I actually spent um, I spent an entire morning working with the lab staff so that I could better understand uh, what really their work was about and 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 I've done that in a number of components so you know then spending some time working in the enrollment center with the advisors really to better understand what their work is and to and so so I think there's that balance but I think sometimes you really do need to take a deep dive into people's experience and then then something that I just enjoy doing is I enjoy if someone will invite me I enjoy visiting classes and not so much visiting classes to talk but actually visiting classes to see um, innovative uh, teaching and learning in that classroom um, so that that I can really better understand some of the the trends that are going on in terms of teaching and learning Hi, my name is Gwyneth Murphy and I'm the HR. And my question is, can you share with us your experience in mitigating layoffs during tough budgetary times? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that somebody, I, I remember speaking to a group of doctoral students at ASU and the question is what keeps you up at night? And um, that's probably the one thing that keeps me up at night is that when you are responsible uh, for um, organization that employs a lot of people, then um, you're responsible for livelihoods of people. And um, uh, I have had to, um, you know, uh, lead during a time of reduction in force. And um, I will say that that's probably the hardest thing I've ever done is, is, is that. Now, in San Francisco, it, it, the, the, we didn't have a lot of influence. San Francisco set up interesting in that, I don't know if you probably know that, but the, the San Francisco City College employees are actually civil servants of the city and county of San Francisco. So what's really uh, interesting is that uh, I had a, a wonderful worker at the downtown campus, and I, as the dean, I was notified on a Friday that someone from another department in the city and county of San Francisco was bumping that person, and so he was gone, and I didn't have any, any say over that at all, right? Um, so, so something that you don't have as much control of. Uh, but in terms of the reduction in force, um, we 
we try to do, at least I've tried uh, to do as much of that through attrition as possible. And, and, and attrition will sometimes get you there and sometimes attrition will not get you there. And when attrition doesn't get you there, then yes, you have to sit down and tell someone that th they, are, they are being laid off. Um, I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong person. Uh, who, uh, where, where, there's, there's, there's Gwen. Um, and so uh, this was my approach. Um, is that as the president, um, I didn't, first of all, I didn't, I don't delegate that conversation to the dean or to the vice president, but to have that conversation myself with the person uh, and, and to try to, um, try to, try to make that uh, process as, um, as, uh, you know, as painless as possible in terms of are we giving uh, uh, an acceptable severance uh, package and are we giving uh, appropriate, um, uh, you know, uh, out, uh, outsourcing in terms of, you know, helping that person find other employment and so forth. But um, so long story short is that I think uh, you, can, you can do a lot of this through attrition, but sometimes you can't and the organization has to make difficult decisions. Now, um, one of the things that's important is that you're working with uh, your local unions to make sure that that process uh, abides by all of the contracts and so forth for reduction in force. So I, I want to thank you very much for your answers and, and also to thank our community for interesting questions. Um, we now have an opportunity for you to make a kind of closing statement. And um, right, thank you. Uh, so I just like to first of all I'd like to thank you. Thank you for those questions. I thought those questions were very, um, very direct and. Um, and very informative for me, and I hope they were informative for you as well. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've spent some time r really looking at the district, and uh, I think that um, a, a lot of my background has prepared me uh, for this role, uh, and uh, I hope that this conversation has been informative for you uh, in, in helping you decide on who your next chancellor will be. Um, the one thing that I would bring to the district is I would certainly bring a passion for uh, student success and a commitment uh, to providing the best educational opportunities as possible for your students. And with that, I will say good night. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. And, um, Thank you again for your graciousness, for your interest in us, and for spending, spending this time. Right, thank, thank you. It's been nice to be back in the Bay Area for a couple days. <laughs> so I want to remind folks to, if, if you possibly can, please do fill out the survey, either um, hard copy or electronically. I think it's really, really quite, quite meaningful. Any questions at all that I can answer about next steps? Thank you for being here. I know it's a it's a, a very important week for many of us as we um, do our final classes and send our students forward, hopefully to a successful finals week. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you.